Hey, good evening, everyone. This is Lacey Johnson. Uh, welcoming you to this edition of the Lacey Johnson Podcast. Uh, as advertised, we're going to be doing a little urine review here. And part of that year in review, we're going to touch a little bit on politics in the past election uh, here in Minnesota, nationwide and locally. And uh, but our guest tonight, and speaking of uh, analyzing the past election, uh, is Dr. Scott Jensen. Uh, Dr. Jensen was the gubernatorial candidate here in Minnesota. Well, so we're going to talk to him about that and his experiences there, probably his future, uh, his assessment of the political landscape per se. So we're going to get into that right now. And I'm proud to welcome Dr. Scott Jensen. Welcome, Scott. I think we had 125,000 people join our email team. We had thousands of volunteers. Uh, we raised $6 million, and that had never been done in a Republican governor's race. So we felt good about all that. But at the end of the day, uh, Tim Walls won by 190,000 votes, and I think he had a lot of money to spend. He had a machine. The Democrats know how to chase, and they did a good job. And so we need to press pause, reflect on what went well, what went poorly. And Republicans stopped this streak of having lost 30 statewide races in a row. Yeah, well, I tell everybody, I have a little experience in uh, networks and there's seven layers to connectivity across a network and the bottom layer is the hardware. And what I'm getting to uh, Scott, and I've been pretty honest up front about this. I think until we solve this media issue, it's going to be an up, unnecessarily uphill battle. Uh, and, and because everything was lined up, like you said, and even if you take the Supreme Court ruling on Roe v. Wade, uh, and this is just me, and I'm not just going to, uh, if the media was more balanced, there would be an outcry about someone actually going in and illegally uh, re obtaining those briefs prematurely, those drafts, and releasing it to the media. And I think if you look at the fact that to this day, the story has disappeared, no one has been held accountable for it. 
And I think we're dealing with a system of media, a system of institutions that's squarely against conservatives. And until we solve that issue, uh, it's going to always be, to me almost, like going to an inside street in poker. And so, once again, I think that's one of the issues that we uh, 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 that, that you came across. But the other part of it is, is that uh, I understand, and you talked about the advantages, uh, there were a lot of third party type of money and organizations running here. Uh, and I'm assuming that you and Matt were aware of that. Is that correct? We were. We were very aware of the fact that when it came to dollars and cents, there was probably some 20 to $30 million spent on Governor Wall's behalf, and we might have had a couple of million spent on our behalf. Yeah, yeah. In, in politics, it's hard to overcome that. Okay, so before we go any further, uh, I uh, recognize the fact that you were in your medical uh, attire. Uh, how, how was your medical practice affected uh, by your campaign at all? Uh, did you see a decrease? Of, and when you came back, were you able to rebuild your patient base? Or were you affected in any kind of way that way? Well, we had to basically create a new policy for me. There's six providers Catalyst Medical Organization. And I was getting overwhelmed during the course of the campaign with people who wanted me to be their physician. And I had reduced appointment time availability because of the campaign. So two years ago, I stopped taking new patients. And so that allowed me to keep up better because I did practice medicine all the way through the campaign. Certainly toward the last two months, my time in the office was limited. But once the election was over, three days later, I was back in the office full time and seeing a full slate of patients. I have just wonderful patients and I've taken care of so many of them for 30, 35 years, and it's it's been good to be back in the office. And many of my patients have expressed that we weren't victorious in the governor's race, but they also have expressed appreciation that I'm back in the office full time and a little bit easier to get on uh, get an appointment. So I I was very fortunate. I I have had a full blessed Lacey, and I feel it was the honor of a lifetime to be the candidate for the Republican Party in 2022 to run alongside of people uh, like Matt Burke and Jim Schultz and Brian Wilson, Kim Crockett, and so many other congressional races and legislative races. And to have people like you at uh, at my side helping and, and Mike Murphy and Neil Shaw and Kendall Qualls and uh, Rich Stanek and Paul Gazelka and Michelle Benson. It, it was a privilege uh, to be the candidate, and I wish I could have delivered a victory. But I think what you mentioned before, when you've got the media stacked against you and you don't have the machine that the Democrats have and you don't have the money uh, that they have in independent expenditures, it's very difficult. And then you throw into the mix for the very controversial Roe v. Wade uh, decision by the Supreme Court. And, yeah, it was an uphill climb. And just one more thing on the Roe v. Wade uh, issue and uh, outside help uh, for uh, Governor Waltz. Uh, one thing, and, and I think most people, they had specific quotes that you made on abortion. Uh, and do you remember where you made those quotes at and, and the context you made them in? Because we know they, we, we can always edit a video to pull out something juicy in media for, for media uh, presentation. So do you, I guess basically, and I hate asking compound questions, uh, do you recall when you made those quotes at, or were they really your quotes, I should say, but do you recall that? Those quotes were pulled out of context, but each, mm -hmm. I think there were two sources. One, our interview with Mike Mulcahy, and one was a speech at a BPOU uh, convention. And both of those were prior to the Roe v. Wade decision being overturned. I think that it's easy to get caught up in political rhetoric. 
my entire adult life, from the time I graduated from high school in 1973, which was when the Roe v. Wade decision was issued by the Supreme Court, I have lived under the Roe as most Americans have for, if not all of their adult life, a good share of it. And so to talk about abortion in a more politically rhetorical way is, is pretty typical, guilty of that. And I think that I was making speeches referencing viable pregnancies being ended in abortion, saying that, yeah, I thought we could ban those kinds of situations. And basically what we're talking about there was third trimester, but it wasn't clear necessarily in the speech I was giving. And it wasn't clear when I think uh, public radio interviewed me. But from my perspective, uh, Minnesotans have indicated two things pretty clearly in polls. One is that two thirds of Minnesotans do not believe that abortion should be banned completely. But two thirds of Minnesotans also, approximately two thirds, don't agree with abortions being available for non-medical, non-rape, non-incest reasons through the day of birth, but rather two-thirds of Minnesotans indicate that third trimester abortions should be avoided. So I think within those two parameters, I think Minnesotans are going to have to decide where they want to come down on the issue. And because Roe v. Wade was overturned, each of the 50 states will make their own decisions. And I, I regret that I wasn't a better communicator prior to the Roe v. Wade decision, but I certainly feel like the Roe v. Wade decision has absolutely required of each state to be thoughtful and to make their decision as to uh, what the law of the state of Minnesota will be. Right. So just one quick thing. I, I, I heard you mention that part one of the quotes was from a BPOU. It being relatively new as far as how the political process worked, when I heard that, my thought was there was a, for lack of a better word, a spy at the BPOU, uh, one of your, and I know politics works this way, uh, one of your opponents or someone uh, provided that uh, uh, quote, a clip to one of your opponents. Am I, how, 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 did, how did they get out of the BPOU, I guess, in, in your, it is, I know it's a small thing, but I'm just curious. Uh, BPOU is, stands for Basic Political Organizational Unit. And in March, we had BPOU conventions all across the state of Minnesota. And frequently, there would be trackers where people would track. I mean, I, mean, I would say that the, the great majority of the public meetings I spoke at did indeed have people uh, videoing and recording every word I said, and clearly indeed did that at one of the BPOU conventions, and it was then uh, cut and spliced uh, to grab onto the words that would be most impactful, and that's politics. Yes, it is. It is. No, you're complaining about that. As a matter of fact, I know you gave a kind of like a town hall downtown Minneapolis, and you can tell us when certain people are there uh, for the opposition. And I think there's at least one or two there. Uh, by the way, uh, you mentioned you haven't eaten all day, Scott. Uh, that is not good for a doctor, by the way. But uh, where I'm going with that, you're in good shape evidently because I saw a video on the uh, on election night just before you and Matt gave your concession speech and Scott, if I didn't know any better, I would swear you ran and jumped up on the stage. Did I remember that correctly? You showed a lot of energy there, so it looked like you're in, in, in good shape. Uh, what did I see that correctly? You jumping up on stage? Uh, I think you might have. I think I do have a lot of energy, and I've been blessed with good health. I'm 68 years old, and I watch I watch my weight. I don't have as good a diet as I should, but. I try to eat at least one meal a day, and I try to always have at least a, one serving of fruit and vegetables. And I've gotten a little bit pickier about carbohydrates, though I must confess, I really do like 
cookies and uh, crackers and cheese and donuts and sweet rolls. Uh, but I do know that if I'm not going to eat regularly, I need to make sure that I'm getting some good sorting and uh, fruit and vegetables. And I do uh, try to stay in shape. I do uh, a bunch of push-ups every morning when I get out of bed. And I get my steps in just running up and down the halls at the clinic. And I have seven grandchildren, five years of age and under. And uh, they keep me running as well. Well, you're shaming this 68-year-old, and I got to get back in the gym. And you know, I've been through some medical situations. I get my body back, uh, but I will do that. And I've said to my wife, my goal is to hit, hit 10 straight three-pointers before the end of the year. That's the goal I'm setting for myself. Setting for myself. Now, here's the thing. Looking back, uh, we talked about some of the issues, some of the things you were up against, some of the challenges. Uh, looking back over the campaign, what, if anything, would you have done differently, Scott? Lacey, I think that I could have been more disciplined in terms of some of the word choices and the phraseology I used. It's a challenging world out there for every word and every phrase that you say to be recorded, knowing that someone may come back at you. There were times at rallies where I would make the cuff remark that came from a conversation I had with a patient during the course of the day. And I would mention and not really recognizing that that would be used as a gotcha moment. So I think I disciplined. And I think that there's nothing like on the job training. And it, it grieves me on one hand that we've become a society that is so willing to police another person's or phrases in terms of what they choose. And so were I ever to run again, I, I would absolutely demand of myself that I would be much more disciplined and cautious in terms of what you say, because it isn't easy, Lacey, to have a, a far ranging, easygoing conversation because these things are almost always used as gotcha moments, especially when you've got a media that seems to be slanted in one direction. Yeah. Well, people know that I uh, dip my toes in politics a little bit and very early in the game, I was very conscious of not giving them sound bites. And, 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 and you probably had handlers too. Who, and see, I'm not very good at repeating the same message over and over and, and just memorizing stuff. I've always, and it's always a trade off. I think uh, they wanted me to stick to the message, but most of the time I didn't listen. And, and the reason I did, and I, I didn't get into too much trouble. It was mine, I did. Uh, but I, I, I figured out very early that my honesty and passion came through more when I just forgot that, got up to the audience, and I'm comfortable doing it and just speaking off the cuff. But I know exactly what you mean. They're just sitting there waiting uh, for a gotcha moment. And, and, and hold on, studio. My, I'm talking about this tech person. Keep that prize, a prize of the time. You can cut this out. Let me know what to, because he got six o'clock and I don't, I don't see a clock. Oh, okay, you want to keep Yeah, there, let me know. Okay. Let me know how many minutes do we have? He cut this out. How many minutes? We yeah. got twenty minutes. Twenty minutes. Okay, good, 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 good. Okay, so, so Scott, uh, let's uh, segue into a, another issue. You kind of touched on it uh, as far as GOP winning uh, state elections here in Minnesota, statewide elections in Minnesota. Yeah, a tough hill to climb, but actually, it's not tough. It really is easier than they think, but people don't get it. Uh, but uh, what was your approach to uh, getting votes uh, in the metro area? Number one, the metro area as a whole, and then the inner city in general, and then where my heart lies, North Minneapolis. So metro, inner city, North Minneapolis, what were the strategies there? Well, I ran the campaign for two years, Lacey, and I spent a lot of time in North Minneapolis with uh, residents from a variety of, if you will, ethnic backgrounds. And I spent a lot of time uh, with black folks and I enjoyed it very much. I learned a lot. Of, I, I certainly met with you in uh, North Minneapolis and Tim Christopher and, and many others. And But I also spent a lot of time in the suburbs and I spent a lot of time 
the meeting with um, ethnic groups such as the Hmong population, the Russian population, the Somalian population, the Ethiopian population. And I, I tried to reach out to all these groups. And, and I think that at some level, we probably achieved some success, but not nearly enough. And so personally, I, I don't know if I have a political future or not, but regardless, I want simply as just a human being on this planet, I want to understand better. Yeah. Well, here's the thing, and our audience might not know that you got intuitively understand. Was that his Wi Fi? You can cut the piece of went out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You, can we, Scott, can you talk? Can, we, uh, can I hear you? 1097. Okay. Good. Good. We're good. Uh, so, yeah, I was around when you came uh, to some of these visits in North Minneapolis in the city. Uh, I think we would agree you got a very good uh, reception. People were very much open to you, and I, I really liked what I saw there. In fact, among my friends, and, and I was thinking about look, even my little niece come to mind, and, and this is what we're talking about, too. She's like, you know, I don't have anything against the Republicans. I vote for them, but out of sight, out of mind. And you do have, a, there is a, a reputation of uh, the Democrats taking advantage of the inner city, and let's say black people, and the Republicans just ignoring them. Uh, do you agree that that's generally true? And what can be done about it if it is? I do agree that it's generally true, Lacey. And I think that two things have to happen. One is, we need to be there now when there's Michael. We need to be going to community meetings, community town halls, NAACP meetings, uh, any kind of meeting. We, we need to be there and learn. I know we can't make all the meetings, but I know I'm making a commitment that I want better. Uh, what that comparable black 68-year-old male lives with that I don't understand. I want to do radio and podcasts with folks from all walks and backgrounds of life. But I think the other thing that has to happen, Lacey, is I think the Republicans have got to recognize, and it's going to be hard, but they've got to recognize that what they're doing isn't working. So then we have to ask ourselves the question, how do we genuinely communicate with people who we may not understand as well as we should or could? And for me, that means we need to understand how the Democrats do it. The idea of knocking on doors and, say, doing banking, I'm not sure that that's as good a strategy as we need. I think the Democrats have been more willing, particularly in those last 60 days before the election, to get out there do whatever they can to help all people feel comfortable voting, getting a ballot, walking through the ballot, understanding who this person is and what they stand for, and this person is and what they stand for, providing a sample. These kinds of techniques, as long as they're within the confines of the law, need to be utilized by the Republicans as well as the Democrats, because the Democrats have become extremely skilled at being in those communities, in those densely populated urban centers, as well as North Minneapolis and South St. Paul, South North St. Paul. And I think that the Republican Party has failed to do that. And I believe that the MNGOP chair, David Han, has made it very clear that this is a commitment of his, that we need to create new strategies strategies that will be more effective because we will not win statewide races unless we can do a better job of connecting uh, with people in the urban areas as well as uh, north and south suburbs of St. Paul and Minneapolis, but also the first spring suburbs. Well, uh, I think, uh, I recall you got support in the Hmong community, the Hmong Council. Uh, I know the Somali community is... Uh, 
trending towards the Republican. I think he had a big dinner out there with two or 3,000 people among the Somali community. And I've talked to a lot of people, Latino community, a lot of people who are entrepreneurially bent uh, tend to support the policies of the Republicans. And so uh, am I, uh, my assessment correct is that you are making forays into these different communities and it, it's promising and it's something you can build upon. Absolutely, you are correct, Lacey. And I think particularly when I talk about, you know, uh, uh, ethnic uh, communities, the Latino community has been a, a wonderful community to interface with because they're engaging in, in a powerful way. Uh, there, you you can understand and see uh, a depth of understanding in in the Latino community. These uh, these folks are absolutely committed to uh, supporting small businesses. Mm. So again, whether you're talking about the Black community, the Somalians, the Ethiopians, the Hmong, the Latinos, these communities, many of them understand with more clarity why they're passionate about the democratic American Republic. They've been, or their parents, grandparents, or grandparents have been in a different place where the freedoms that we take for granted were not present. So we really have a lot to learn from uh, the, if you will, various ethnic groups that exist within the Twin Cities, as well as across the state. Yeah, I think you hit on a good point there. If I would look at it from a business standpoint, and if I would look at the Republican Party as a business, and I would look at voters in these various communities as the target markets, uh, I will conclude that the Republicans don't understand the target markets of the metro areas in the inner city. They don't understand the customers there. And one of the things I'm getting at, and I've been pretty much up front of that, is that uh, the visuals, a picture says a thousand words. And Scott, when most voters, especially people of color, uh, look at the Republican Party, they see, they hardly see themselves in pictures of the Republican Party. Uh, are the, based on your experience, are the leaders of the party aware of this? And I just think about and I'm going to give you a chance to answer. I think about the time that Dave Hand was elected president. They had a, a video on the news. And I, as a person of color, like, this is not good. I don't see how many people of color in here. So two-part question, uh, and I think I know the answer some of them. Are the Republicans aware that a picture tells a thousand stories? And what are they going to do about changing quote unquote, the color of that picture, the diversity of those pictures, I should say. I think the Republican Party is aware of it. They redoubled their efforts specifically in regards to trying to be at community events, whether it was a Hmong festival or uh, the Super Eid at um, the, the stadium, uh, whether it was uh, working with these uh, to make sure that we're reaching out to kids providing opportunities educationally, ethically, uh, the arts. But I don't think we've done enough. And I think that we need to be far more aware uh, when we're doing our outreach to make certain that when you see that picture that's worth a thousand words, that you see in a moment uh, a more diverse group of people coming from all walks of life. I, I think that Lacey, I think it's very important. We can do better. Frankly, if we don't do better, we're going to continue to get the kind of results we got. Yeah, you're exactly right. And I like the idea even of uh, being involved with the nonprofit because this is what I'm getting to. Uh, a lot of this, especially if you're talking about uh, people overcoming the reputation of the Republican brand and going into a booth for the first time and, and vote Republican, this depends a lot on personal relationships and connections. And this is where I'm going, Scott, and I think I mentioned what, after I got involved a little in politics, what struck me is that 
most of the voters that I know in the inner city, they all know Democrats. And they had Democrats in their homes. They've hung out with Democrats. Their kids play with Democrat kids. Where, why don't we have any personal connections in these inner city where people know you and, and they can speak up for you and they can even uh, uh, campaign for you because they know you personally? Because it's going to take some of that, I think, to overcome what we have to overcome to get these votes. Just personal connections. And is that in it? Do, and, and by the way, everything I say, I could be totally wrong about, but that's just what I'm, my assessment. And if you agree with that, is there any plans besides organizations? Because some kind of way, uh, it seems like uh, the voters in these communities have to know what well, I know Lacey, he's a Republican, he's a good guy, I trust him. And I know he's fighting for the community. What can we do to create a better atmosphere of personal relationships and connections in these geographical areas that we're talking about? Lacey, I don't think there's any, any magic answer. I think that it's just going to take rolling up your sleeves and getting involved in these urban settlements, be involved with. I think that that's why I made the commitment that I want to definitely be in those neighborhoods in North Minneapolis and South Minneapolis, and not just in an election season, but it's the right thing to do. We need to do a better job of integrating our daily connections. And I don't think that we've done enough. I think there's a lot of people that see the Republican Party as a white man, and I think we have to change that. Right. So when I look at the challenges facing these, a lot of these disadvantaged communities, communities of color, black community, I look at uh, business development. We don't have too many for-profit, job-generating, technology, financial investment companies in these community in North Minneapolis. As a matter of fact, I told someone, I think there was 241 nonprofits. And that's probably the scam and the scheme too, by the way. But I, I'm not gonna get it. <laughs> I'm not gonna get into that here. But what can we do? Well, what I'm getting to, Scott, is that I believe if a Republican want to change people's minds, we have to show people that we made a positive, visible, measurable difference in their lives. They got money in their pockets. They're able to go out to dinner. They send their kids to school that provides a quality education where their children are reading at the proper grade level. And I believe that there's a role for churches and spirituality and faith also. So how do we, how do we make a difference in people's lives? Because once again, I think that's one of the key because I think most people in these communities realize the Democrats aren't making that much of a difference in their lives. In fact, their lives are getting worse than voting for Democrats. So how can we actually do some things to make a difference in people's lives? Well, they do have money. They do have quality education. They do have spirituality in their lives and a moral compass and those type of things, Scott. I think we've got to do three things. Uh, first off, we've got to show these communities of, of, of people of color that we care. If if you can't, if you don't show that you care, so that'd be that'd be step number one. You got to show me care. That means you, you've got to be there. Uh, the second thing is, your efforts cannot represent uh, nothing more than a token. If if all you're doing is providing token or a token chunk of money to simply, if you will, demonstrate on a superficial level that you're paying attention during a campaign season. I don't think it's going to work. The third thing is all of our efforts have to be focused on one word, and that's sustainability. And sustainability is far more likely to be achieved if we help people of color have for-profit, successful small businesses that grow from this to this to this. And with that, employees are hired, community pride grows, 
new ideas are spawned so that this company can become this, this, and this company. And I think those are the things we have to do. We've got to show we care. We can't be doing token work. And we've got to make certain that what we're doing is sustainable. And if we're wondering what might feel sustainable for a community of people of color, we have to look into ourselves and say, if I were in their shoes, what would I want? What would I think might make a lasting impact? Well, I think this is all very great. So you mentioned, you touched briefly, and I know we were out of respect at your time, you touched briefly on your future plans. You haven't made a decision yet. Is that my understanding right now, Scott? Because I know how that goes. Yeah, I mean, I'm 68, so I'm no spring chicken. And statistically, I've lived 80% of my life span. Right. So I know what I'm going to do in 2026. I don't. But I know this. I know that I'm going to stay engaged with the communities all across Minnesota because this two-year opportunity I had really fired me up to realize just how many great people there are in Minnesota. I also know that I'm not willing to stand on the sidelines. I want to be involved. And lastly, Lacey, important to me that I not be perceived as someone who is trying to become some sort of a self-appointed oversight committee for what Governor Walls is trying to do. Governor Walls has gotten a clear opportunity to work with a Democratic-led House, Democratic-led Senate, and he has made it very clear that he is going to help lead these robust, big conversations. And I think all Minnesotans get that and recognize that we should be engaged as the individual citizens who we are. But I think over the next year or two, we're going to see some significant legislation passed. We're going to see big time take place. And I think whether we're Republican, Democrat, Independent, or whatever, we need to be engaged, stay engaged, and recognize that we belong in the arena. Well, I suspect what's going to happen is that now that they're in control, they're going to shoot themselves in the foot with some a lot of crazy type of policy. I already read where uh, they're putting uh, critical race theory as a requirement for teacher training and, and transsexual education as a requirement of teacher training. And I don't think a lot of voters know about that. I've been getting some uh, very good uh, concerns about the crime here and people wonder why it happened. And I'm trying to, hey, you, you voted these people in and you knew what they were good for. So uh, I, I suspect that uh, they're going to pass some policies that people don't agree with. Now, if the past is in an uh, indicator, there's going to be one issue that's going to come up that's going to defeat all the bad things that they've done and make people forget about it and vote on that one issue, whether it's abortion, Trump, or whatever. And that's the challenge that we face. Uh, that's just one of my concerns. So as you look forward, and this is the last thing, uh, when you look across uh, what's going on here locally, across the state and nationally, uh, what are some of your, well, what is your major concern as far as the future uh, and as far as things that are affected by politics? What's your major concern, Scott? Well, I think, go ahead. I'm gonna go back to what I campaign. We talked a lot about inflation, crime, and education. And I will grant that the governor does not have the ability to impact as much as he or she might like to on some of the areas of economics. There are things that a governor can do. But I think that we have to focus on crime and helping people feel safe. If you don't feel safe, you're not safe. It's that. And I think when it comes to education, we've got to ask ourselves, are we allowing our system to be, because what we're supposed to be doing is calling on the priority to be each kid. Mm -hmm. One size doesn't fit all. One size fits one in education. We need to help release and school districts and parents and kids to get the best outcome they can. 
education, this might sound trite, Lacey, but I, I believe that education truly is the ticket to the mm -hmm. life most of us want to live. So we have got to know education. We've got to help people feel safe. And as much as is possible, the governor needs to make certain that the policies he puts in place are not inflationary in nature. So uh, thank you for being on the show, Scott. I, I just want our audience to know that uh, when I met you the first time, I thought you had a great spirit about you, and I appreciated that. And you haven't done anything to uh, show anything different uh, since I met you, and I'm looking forward to because I'm in. I'm just uh, out to improve the lives of the people in these communities, and we've hit on some things with with business development, with education, uh, with uh, some type of moral compasses that normally come with uh, faith and religion. Uh, however, that moral compass comes. And then something I really want to stress that I didn't mention earlier, uh, we got to put the family back together and make it the key focus in the building block of successful community and successful civilization. And there's a lot of places where the family is just disintegrated. And I don't know whether, and this is my soapbox, I don't know why anybody think we can come up with a program to prevent a lot of this violence and crime and stuff that's going on, a lot of things that's going on until we put the family back together. But I don't hear people talking that way, uh, but I'm gonna talk that way and maybe uh, it will uh, build a crescendo and we'll start doing something about it. So Scott, uh, let's stay in touch. Looking forward to seeing you at the next NAACP meeting. Look forward to seeing you involved. And I'm looking forward to working with you to actually get some results. Um, I don't like, you know, my, my, my background is corporate engineering. And boy, there's a lot of talking and not getting anything done in politics that just rubs me the wrong way. We're not solving problems. There's a lot of emotions, opinions. You know, we're, we're data and fact people and, and analytical people and politics people seeing the form of opinion and think that's the answer right off the bat without any, any analytics or anything. So uh, I will continue to work with you uh, and anyone else who want to get these things done. So thank you for appearing on, this, on my podcast, Scott. And like I say, looking forward to working with you in the future and looking forward to seeing you at the next NWCP meeting. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Lacey. Hey, no, no, no. I got to do this. I'm oh, sorry. Excuse me. Look, a tech guy. Come on. Man. No, I got to do it. Hey, give us one last word uh, to sign off with, Scott. I would say this. Minnesota has a proud tradition of tapping everybody's capabilities, everybody's energies. We need to do that now more than ever. I've always been proud to be a Minnesotan. Keep that feeling. There are times where I haven't felt as good about being a Minnesotan as I would like to over the last few years. Do better. We got to do better. And the only way we do better is for each of us to stand side by side in the arena and not allow ourselves to sort of slink over to the sidelines and become a spectator. It's on us. Thanks, Lacey. Thank you. All right. Have a good evening, Scott. Look forward to talking to you soon.